about their ministry, go to the missions corner after the service and you can find out more. I wanna read a passage to you from Mark chapter four as I jump into the message today. And it's a famous passage of scripture, you're probably familiar with it, Mark chapter four, verse 35. That day when evening came, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowds behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. The waves broke in over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. The wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Then they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. I'll get back to the passage in just a moment. Today is Super Bowl 56, in case you didn't know. That's happening today. Was anybody here unaware of that? Don't raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> thank you. It, today's the Super Bowl, right? And it, it's kind of a big deal. A lot of people will be watching the game later, and um, it's a fun celebration. Today is the Patriots, or not the Patriots. I just went blank. Today is the, um, it's the, <laughs> the Bengals and the Rams. Okay, so I'm representing the Jaguars. That tells you a lot right there, right? But no, listen, hey, I have a lot of faith. This is a house of miracles. If the Bengals can turn it around and get there, so can the Jags. We got Trevor Lawrence, right? That's right, do all. That's right. So a lot of people are wearing their different team jerseys today. Uh, I see Janet and her Patrick Mahomes jersey. Uh, sorry about that, Janet. We all thought they would be there. But uh, hey, it does, the Bengals being in the, in the Super Bowl today does give hope for Jaguar fans everywhere. So I'm pretty excited about it. But I was thinking about this, how important it is when you watch a game like the Super Bowl, how important it is to watch and play the whole game. Some of you may remember back in 2017, famous Super Bowl, the Atlanta Falcons. I see you, Joseph, shaking your head. He's a huge Falcons fan. Atlanta Falcons and the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. Halftime. The Atlanta Falcons have the lead 21 to 3 at halftime. Everybody, Falcons fans all over the place are celebrating. We're taking them down. We're beating Tom Brady. We're beating the Patriots. They come out right at the beginning of the third quarter and they score again 28 to 3. Game's not over though. Then Tom Brady and the New England Patriots have the greatest comeback in Super Bowl history and they end up beating the Falcons. And here's the moral of the story the game's not over at halftime. Just because you have the lead at halftime doesn't mean you can celebrate. Just because you have the lead at halftime doesn't mean the game's over. You still have to make adjustments and come out and play the second half. That's why it's so famous. That, uh, the speeches that coaches make during halftime are so famous. You can go online and look up famous halftime speeches because coaches know how important it is to come in at halftime and keep your team focused. And if they're behind, to inspire them and rally them to go back out and play the second half. You'll even watch reporters as the teams are coming back onto the field. They'll say to the coach, what did you tell your team during halftime to get them motivated for the second half? What did you tell your team during halftime to make sure they don't give up the lead? Because what you say at halftime really matters because you've gotta go out and play the second half, amen. I don't know if that's a good place to say amen, but I felt like I needed something. What coaches do is they remind their team of their mission, of their goal. And they remind them that if you do your part and you stick with a game plan, we will be victorious. You go out there and you give 100% to your specific role. You do what you're supposed to do. You focus on your game plan. And if everybody's doing that, we'll be victorious. We'll achieve our goal. They remind them of their goal and they remind them of their role. And so today, we are halfway in our miracles initiative. We're halfway, and I'm gonna give you an update on what that means and why that's so important and where we are and what we're gonna do in the second half. But it's so important to remember our mission and our goal. The Redeemer mission is this, to reach people with the life-giving message of the gospel so that they may become fully devoted followers of Jesus. 
Now, our mission statement is not unlike a lot of churches' mission statements. If you Google church mission statements, they all sound kind of the same. Even though we all try to get clever and put a little twist here, a little twist there to make it sound unique, it all sounds the same, and it should, because we're all on the same co-mission. Jesus gave us all the same mission. The reason that we're here, the reason Redeemer Church is here, is to reach people with the life-giving message of the gospel. There are a lot of good messages out there. There are good TED Talks. There's good do-it-yourself videos. There's inspirational and motivational speeches. You can get on there and find all kinds of things to encourage you in different areas of your life. Those are fine. But our mission is not to reach people with that message. Our mission is to reach people with the message of the gospel because it's the only message that can take somebody from death to life. It's the only message that can transform a person's heart is the message of the gospel. And the reason we're here is to reach this community to reach this city, to reach our world with that message and then disciple them so that, everybody say so that, so that they may become fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's why Gabe was talking about the growth track, that we're all on a growth track. We're all needing to think about what is my next step in my growth, right? Because we all wanna become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And in step three of growth track, we define what fully devoted looks like here because that might mean something different to everybody. And we focus on five core characteristics. They're not the only things, but there are five core things that we will focus on that we wanna see everybody maturing and growing in these areas. And we will do anything we can, like that coach at halftime, we will do anything we can to achieve that goal. That is our mission. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, The Apostle Paul is writing Timothy. This is four years after his first letter to Timothy. Timothy is still pastoring the church in Ephesus. And Paul is writing to encourage him. And Paul says this in 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. He says, I endure all this for the sake of the elect so that they too may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. And what is Paul talking about when he says, I endure all this? Paul, is a, he's, he's under arrest. He's in prison in Rome under Nero. After Nero has gone mad and after half the city is burnt and after he found that Christians were a convenient target to blame everything on and begins persecuting Christians and Paul's wrapped up in that. A little bit later after Paul writes this letter to Timothy, he's beheaded by Nero. And Paul says, it doesn't matter. I endure all this. For the sake of those who have not yet received this, I endure all this for the sake of the elect so that they too, everybody say they too. We endure all this so that they too, it's not just about me, it's not just about you know us four and no more, it's, it's, we, it's for they too. We endure all this so that they too may obtain salvation that's in Christ Jesus. That's what this miracles initiative is all about. Now, eight years ago, our church went through a difficult time. And it was miraculous how we got through that. And I'll get to that in just a moment. So our board came together a couple years ago and they said, you know what? We believe that we really benefited from a miracle. What God did for this church was miraculous. And we wanna be good stewards of that miracle. So we, we began this, they, they initiated this movement, this campaign that we called the Miracles Initiative so that we could be good stewards of that miracle. Eight years ago, as we were facing a very difficult time, we were facing what seemed to be insurmountable obstacles on a lot of different fronts. It did not seem like this church would survive. I was counseling with other pastors around the city, and they were encouraging me, but they're like, man, I've never seen anything like this. It was difficult. There was a lot of different elements converging. One was a big financial crisis. And we were facing a forbearance, a foreclosure by the bank. Well, that, that January, we got the church together and we started praying and seeking God. And we we're saying, we need God's direction. We need God to speak to us. We need to hear from God right now. And you know what? When you're desperate, you pray different, don't you? When you're fat and happy, you don't pray so desperate. But when you're desperate, you cry out to God, you pray. We were in here, we were praying, God, we need to hear from you, we need direction from you. Show us what it is you're calling us to do. And so people were emailing me and talking to me and giving me scriptures and and as I began to put all that together, 
there was one word that really seemed to capture the spirit of what everybody was discerning in one passage of scripture. And the word was release, release. And the scripture was Isaiah chapter 61. I came in at the end of that fast and I preached on that, Isaiah 61. And that was our word. We all grabbed a hold of that word. We're all praying for, that was in January. Well, then that's when the forbearance begins. That's when the foreclosure and all this stuff starts happening. That's when all these other things really started converging and it did not seem like we would survive. Somehow, miraculously, we made it through that season. And it literally was nothing short of a miracle. And then that December, December the 17th, I'm sitting in my office and I receive a certified letter from Iberia Bank. So I open it up and in bold across the top, this is the letter, it's framed and hanging in my office. Look at what it says. So in January, God spoke to us release. And then all this stuff is happening. And then 11 months later, when we got through that storm, this is what shows up the official release. When I opened that up in my office, I literally almost fell out of my chair. I called the staff together, I showed it to them, we started having church, we were laying hands on the sick, we were receiving offering, I mean, everything. We were having church that day. And then I brought that into church that Sunday and I showed it, you could feel everybody's faith level rise. Here's the message. Between January and December, don't doubt. In this passage of scripture I just read, Jesus, it always was curious to me when I read this as a young man, why he was irritated with his disciples. He says, why are you so afraid? You have little faith. I'm like, uh, a storm? Uh, the boat is sinking? I mean, it seems reason, and you're asleep? I mean, it seems reasonable to me, right? And they're waking him. But here's why Jesus was frustrated. Because at the beginning of the story, he tells them, they have his word. Let's go to the other side. We're going to the other side. They already had his word, they were going to the other side. But when they got in the middle and the storm is happening, they begin to doubt, fear rose up. And now they're even questioning if he even cares about them. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe the storm is raging in your life. Maybe you feel like, do you even care that we're gonna drown? The message of this story and the message of Redeemer's experience is this. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of the lake, don't doubt. Between January and December, don't doubt. Keep your eyes on, what he, on him and, and, and your, your faith on what he spoke. So that was a miracle for us. So several years ago, our board is saying, okay, look, we're at a healthier place now. And we wanna be good stewards of that miracle. So we wanted to begin this initiative that we called the Miracles Initiative to be good stewards of the miracle, but also to prepare the way for other miracles in people's lives. And the, the, the real miracle is when somebody's life is transformed by the gospel. The real, and there's, there's a lot of different experiences, but that's our main goal, right? That's why we're here. Here's how we define miracles. I found this helpful. Any event whether explainable or not, which strengthens the faith of believers. This definition is helpful because it removes the criteria that there should be some, that we should dismiss something based on human or scientific explanation. Our inability or ability to explain something is not enough reason to justify if something is a miracle or not. For example, the plagues in the book of Exodus, right? Some would see that as miraculous, but then there are people who doubt that would find ways to explain it away. That's how it is with any kind of miracle. So that's why this definition is so helpful. Any event, whether explainable or not, which strengthens the faith of believers. Because here's the reality. Sometimes we miss the extraordinary because it looks ordinary. How many people missed that Jesus was the incarnation of God, that he was the son of God, that he was the Messiah walking? How many people missed it because he was a little boy just like them, because he became a man just like them, because he was a carpenter trained by Joseph. How many people missed it because it just looked ordinary? So many times we miss the extraordinary thing God is doing in our life because it just looks ordinary. And we're, we need God to move in our lives. We're praying for God to move in the lives of people in our communities, the places that you live and that you work, the places that you hang out for leisure, the places that you go with your kids. 
We want God to move in relationships in our church, in this community. We're believing for miracles. But we have to do our part to prepare the way. So the verse that was adopted by our board for this initiative was Isaiah chapter 57. Here's what it says. Build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. And the context of this for Isaiah is the arrival of a majestic king. As the king is arriving, you prepare the way. If the road is torn down, you build it up. If there's an obstacle in the way, you move it out of the way. Think about just when a dignitary comes to town or a president is coming to town. They send the secret service months ahead to prepare the way for the arrival of that dignitary. That's the context of this prepare the way. Well, we're believing God for the arrival of a majestic king in the lives of people in our community. We have to do our part to prepare the way, to build up, to build a bridge into people's lives, to build a road into people's lives, and to remove obstacles that would prevent us from being able to do that. And so our board identified three areas that we needed to focus on. One of the things that we believed was that God was calling us to be a force of generosity. A church our size and a community our size can be a force of generosity. Here, here's why we grabbed a hold of that. During that difficulty eight years ago, we were meeting with different banks and different financial institutions to try to figure out what we could possibly do. And a number of different bankers told us this. They, they said, Panavidra and Nakatee and now I know everybody doesn't live in this area, but that's where our church is. But they said, Panavidra and Nakati has more creative wealth per capita than any other part of the city. Yet, there's a smaller percentage that goes towards charity and nonprofits in this area percentage than other parts of the city. And they said, we can't figure it out. There's more money here. And it's not that there's less money going, but less of a percentage. And we started thinking, that's not right. We should be influencing this community. What if we could be so generous that we literally become a force to inspire that kind of generosity in our community? God can do that. And I don't just mean by the way you give to church. I mean by the way you live your lives, by how you tip waiters, by the way you behave to people when you're interacting with them, that you're generous with your time, you're generous with your, your love and your forgiveness, that we become a force of generosity. That's one of the five core characteristics we focus on as a fully devoted follower of Jesus is generosity. Well, we defined and identified three things we needed to do in order to do that. One is this, to build up a foundation of financial strength. This was number one. We needed to be a strong place financially. And so that meant Partly, stewardship teaching, training our church. Uh, we're gonna have our, our, our staff going through uh, Compass uh, Discipleship, which is a financial discipleship, biblical stewardship. Our whole staff is going through that because it's something we believe has to happen at every level. Teaching our children, teaching our church, teaching our staff, understanding biblical stewardship. And it's really not even stewardship. It's actually biblical lordship because everything belongs to him. And so it's just being faithful with what he's given to us. It also means saving money, having a six-month war chest and putting things aside so that we're able to be in a strong financial position. That's part of the building up. Remove every obstacle. That for us, that was eliminating our key obstacle, which was the debt. That was a big part of our Miracles Initiative is eliminating the debt, getting rid of that, shifting our money from building bank buildings to building the kingdom of God, shifting our money from debt service to community service. We don't wanna be sending that money down there. We wanna be putting it right into ministry in our community, amen? So a big part of that was to remove that obstacle, our, our debt, getting that out of the way. And then the third one was to empower the people and unlock ministry potential of people right here and of ministries that we want to engage in. And I'm really excited that we're going to be investing and, and uh, doing some significant changes and investments into our family ministry in the coming months. This is really exciting for us. So let me explain to you where we are right now midway in this initiative. When we started this initiative one year ago, this is how much money was committed and pledged by our church. $941,000 were committed towards this initiative. This, what I'm going to tell you right now is amazing. Now, they typically tell you 
when you do an initiative like this, that whatever was pledged, you will probably end up collecting about 80% of that. Halfway through our initiative, here's where we are right now. We have already received $800,000 towards that $941,000. <clears> so over 75% is already here, but we don't wanna be the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> Just because we have the lead at halftime doesn't mean we wanna like chill out, right? Convalesce. We need to keep going. Now, this includes uh, money that was given that was not pledged. So in other words, some people came along the way and jumped in and gave something significant towards this initiative, even though it wasn't a part of the original pledge. And that's fantastic. That's where we are. Here's, here's what that looks like right now in debt reduction. So of the 800,000, 800, 620,000 immediately goes to eliminating debt. Why is it only 620,000 of the 800,000? because the way that our board decided to distribute this money was that 82% would go to debt elimination, 13% would go into savings, and then 5% would go into a facilities reserve because this building's getting older. And how many of you know as you get older, <laughs> things don't work like they used to work? So I've heard. Actually, I've experienced it. <laughs> So you gotta prepare for those, those moments. So that's why of the 800,000, 620 has gone to a debt elimination and the other percentage is 13 to savings and 5% to facilities. The board is in the final stage right now of a refi with our bank that will result in $7,000 of monthly savings. That means right away, right now, for this year, $7,000 a month will no longer be going to debt service that we can shift that money into ministry. That's gonna have a huge impact right away. <laughs> Annually, that looks like about $70,000 this year we'll be able to do that. Now that's as if things stay just as they are right now, that we'll be able to shift that money to impacting lives. That's why we're here, to impacting lives with the gospel, just like these stories that you're gonna hear right now. I came in the front doors for my very first time and immediately met my church family. Over the past couple of years, even during COVID, um, we as a, as a church and a community um, gave more um, in missions uh, giving, even when we, you know people were struggling financially. And many of our missionaries uh, we support about 70 missionaries. They keep reaching out to us and thanking us for being faithful during one of the toughest times for them on the field because not only are they isolated, but many churches have been struggling financially um, and so they have cut back their missions giving. And, and during that period of time, not only has Redeemer as a, as a church um, increased their giving, but we as a mat have been able to uh, give more to our missionaries, including sometimes some year-end bonuses and take on new missionaries. I moved to Florida about two years ago, um, and prior to moving to Florida, I worked uh, in special education with uh, children who had autism, children who have Down syndrome, kids with cerebral palsy. I love coffee. I know a lot of people love coffee. I don't leave without my coffee. So I had this dream of taking these children and going to try and start as a little fruit stand and then a little coffee stand and move to a food truck eventually. Well, after about two years, I had gone through a divorce and I was kind of on my own, kind of pushed that dream to the side, said goodbye to my students and with all the faith I had, <laughs> which was not much, I moved to Florida, picked up, moved to Florida. So I found myself last year in the midst of the Miracles campaign without a car. My car literally died. And I didn't, I was new to Jacksonville. I had no way to get another car. So I put my new car, praying for the miracle on the wall and waited. Seven months later, someone gave me a car. They had behind the scenes, worked with my fam Redeemer family here and got all the paperwork together, ready to give it to me on a Sunday morning. They hand me the paper, the title to the car. And they said, let's go, let's go get your car. Sometimes during tough times that people will um, hold back giving because they're not, they're not certain of their future. And the fact that uh, during these times, many are, have been so committed 
to, to giving to both missions and the Miracles Initiative and supporting Redeemer Church through the tithe and offering, that in and of itself, I believe, is nothing short of a miracle. Emily had called me or texted me and said, hey, you know, we're looking for somebody to run the coffee shop. I'm like ecstatic at this point because that had always been a dream of mine to run a coffee shop, not just a coffee shop, but with kids with special needs, deaf children. And I was like, wow, this is God opening a door. I've been doing it almost a year now. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a family come to me uh, who are involved in special nations. Their son has autism. and came over and said, hey, you know, we'd like to get him involved. What are your thoughts about having him maybe help in the cafe? And of course, again, I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, like this is my dream. I'm getting that portion of my life back. So now I'm serving with them at Next Steps. And I love it because I have been through Growth Track and I understand um, the vision of Redeemer. So I can be able to share that with other people when they come in and meet new people and make them feel welcome like I did. Since I've been here, little miracles have been happening and it's just trusting in God for everything. And so, and I just wanna say thank you to my Redeemer family because I couldn't have made it without you. I think the giving as, as a whole um, through missions and miracles shows the heart of the Redeemer family and um, that we really do wanna reach the lost with the life-giving message of the gospel so that they can become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So we're very excited about where we are right now. Let me give you another little update of where we are. Uh, Pledge is outstanding. Is, so I told you all that we've received, but that was over and above those that have pledged. Currently, we still have about 403 pledges outstanding, but this is only the second half. So we wanna encourage everybody to continue on, continue to believe, continue to pray, continue to give. If you're new to the church and you weren't a part of this initiative in the beginning, we invite you to join us if you would, would like to. Again, we don't want anybody to feel pressured or you know, manipulated in any way, but we're excited about what God has called us to. And the mission and the giving that we're doing to this initiative is over and above the tithes and offerings. And the giving that we're able to do to missions is over and above that. We actually, I believe, tripled our missions giving uh, that Dave was talking about in the video uh, during that same time frame. So uh, this, you're a very generous church. We really are gonna be a force of generosity in this community, amen? So here's what it looks like percentage-wise. If you were to look at like Redeemer Church, those that are in green are everybody that's engaged in this initiative. Those that are in gray are maybe those that haven't yet engaged. You're kind of sitting on the sidelines, maybe not fully engaged. We wanna encourage you to get in the green. Uh, to be a part of this initiative uh, in some way, praying, giving. Uh, again, we don't want you to feel pressured, but we have a, we have a, we're excited about what God has called us to do, and we want everybody to be a part of that. And even though we're only halfway and we got the lead, we're not done. And so there's a card in the seat in front of you if you're new to this church and you've never been a part of it, uh, you can use that. There's also some at the tables in the back of the auditorium and at the Next Steps area on your way out. If you're online, uh, you can, uh, in the chat, they'll have information for you how you can be a part of that initiative if you want to. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training and they do so that they get a crown that will not last. But we do it that, to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. I mean, think about that. Think about watching the Olympics and seeing everybody line up and they're all in there. They're up, you know how they do when they get up there and they're doing all this stuff and they're smacking all their, you know, and they get in, and they get in the blocks and everything is, everything is focused and they're right there and they're just waiting to hear that gun, boom, and they take off. And what if one of the runners just started zigzagging across the, it would just be so weird, right? That's not what you do. And Paul's saying, don't do that in your spiritual life either. Don't run aimlessly run in such a way as to win the prize. Later he says in the same letter in chapter 15, he says, therefore my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Winning a Super Bowl and holding up that trophy 
is temporary. I remember years ago hearing about a famous surfer, Barton Lynch, who competed in the Pipeline Masters. It was his lifelong goal. He wins the Pipeline Masters, and he's standing up there and achieving this lifelong dream. Within minutes of being on the scaffolding and getting this award, the storm just rolls in, scatters everybody. Media's gone, everybody's gone. They even take the trophy back. He didn't even get to keep it. He has a picture of it. And he's standing there in that moment feeling completely empty. Like, this is what I spent my life for. And like, I'm here now and it's completely empty. Paul, the apostle Paul is saying here, we're not pursuing that kind of goal or that kind of crown, but something that will last forever. Therefore, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Think about people that give themselves fully to a gold medal in the Olympics, to a Super Bowl trophy, to winning the Pipeline Masters. They give themselves fully to it. And Paul's saying, let's give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's what this initiative is about. I wanna encourage you to do that in your own life, in your own pursuits. I don't know where you are in your life right now, but I wanna encourage you with this passage from the book of Esther. We've been in this series on Esther and we paused it today to do this halftime celebration, but I do wanna mention this. In Esther chapter three, there's this plot to destroy the Jews. I shared with you last week that during Purim, when they read the story of Esther, every time they say the name of this bad guy, everybody boos. That's part of their tradition. They read it every year. They do this story every year during Purim. They read it. And when they get to this part where this plot and this, this, this evil, vindictive guy named Haman is mentioned, that was a little lame, but let's try. I mean, that was like a golf clap boo. So whenever they mention the name Haman, oh, that's much better, much better. Everybody boos, right? Because Haman has this plot to destroy the Jews and he manipulates the king and then tricks him into issuing a decree uh, to destroy them. Mordecai finds out about it. And Mordecai goes into, he's lamenting and he's praying and he's fasting and he sends a message to Esther because Esther is now has, has a royal place. And he says to Esther, you, you could say something, you could do something about this. And Esther sends a message back to Mordecai, her, her cousin, and says, there's a law that if anybody approaches the king and has not been summoned, it's death. That's the law. Unless the king extends his golden scepter. Mordecai sends word back to her and says, what well, I'm about to read to you right now in Esther chapter four, verse 14. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to the ro your royal position for such a time as this. This principle is, tr this speaks to us about the providence and sovereignty of God. That whatever the circumstances are around our lives, that God has something to do with it. And Mordecai's saying here to Esther, who knows, but that you've come to this royal position for exact such a time so that you can do something about it. We'll look into that more next week as we get back into our series on Esther. But I wanna say that to you today. It's true, it was true for Esther, and it's true for you as well because we believe God created you, that he placed you on the planet for such a time as this. And who knows, but that you've come here today or you're online worshiping with us today for such a time as this. Let's do our part. Let's play this second half. Let's remove every obstacle. Let's build up the way so that people all around this community, the people all around the world, like where our missionaries are serving, can receive the arrival of a majestic king. That's our part. And that's what this initiative is all about. Would you guys stand with me as we prepare for communion here in just a moment? Just to bring it back to a real personal application for everybody here today. Back to the original story I opened up with, with Jesus in the boat and the storm happening. You may be in the middle of a storm in your life and I just wanna encourage you, you're gonna make it to the other side. 
continue, you know, where he says, why are you so afraid? Maybe you feel like that. Do you not care that we're gonna drown? I wanna encourage you just to continue to, and even if you have to wake him up and say that, I appreciate their honesty. Maybe you need to, maybe you need to speak up like that and cry out like that, but I wanna encourage you. You're gonna make it to the other side, and we are gonna make it to the other side. That's his promise for us. We're gonna come to communion here in just a moment. We do this every Sunday. This is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus said to do this in remembrance of him. It reminds us that we have a covenant with God that has nothing with our ability to fulfill it. He did. The entire Old Testament points forward to this moment. The entire New Testament points back to this moment. This is the gravitational center of our faith. So this morning, before we receive communion together, we wanna take a moment and just evaluate our own lives to examine our own hearts before the Lord, to pray a prayer of confession because we all sin. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and I say some things in the prayer that are kind of generic, but don't make it generic. When we're saying these things, you be specific in your own heart about what it is you're confessing. Because we have the promise that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we're gonna receive communion together. We'll pray a prayer of, of surrender to the Lord and then we'll receive communion together. Would you bow your hearts before the Lord and just, I'll lead you, you repeat after me, but you, you pray it in faith. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you. Be my Lord. And Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated.